Welcome back to The Deal Room. And before I begin, Stephen did share a slight script with me (laughs) where I was going to give this fantastic opening. But then whilst discussing what we're going to discuss, Stephen, you just said it way better than than, than the script about why are we going to do this mini series about explaining M&A, about case studies, about how that could be useful for applications that are ongoing. You just said it to me literally two minutes ago off air that was so perfect as to the rationale behind a new kind of using the deal room for a, a mini series. So, so what was that rationale? Yeah, so over the next over the next four episodes, we're going to spend a bunch of time going through why companies acquire other companies. It's a standard. If you were to read the M and A textbook in your undergraduate course, you would probably get your six or seven reasons why one company might want to acquire another company, and maybe a couple of reasons why a company might want to be sold. But we're going to put this into a mini series, partly because. As you get interviews and as you prepare for assessment centers, it's fantastic to have to be armed with this information and to be armed with it in a couple of relatively short po- podcast episodes. Secondly, because we spend all of, we spend all of our time teaching this, uh, discussing it in the deal uh, the deal of the week, putting it in the podcast. So just just to add a bit of structure to what we already do in order to help you become slightly better with regards to your application process and your interview process and your assessment center process, it makes sense. And hopefully it's going to be a really, a really fun couple of episodes. Okay, cool. So look, to give you um, a bit of insight as to what we're going to cover in this first episode of the four part series, we're going to look at economies of scale and reacting to competition. We're going to use Sheehan's acquisition of misguided and also going to look at Google's $2 billion investment in the AI company Anthropic. So we'll also take a look at some other things. We've had this recent wave of mega deals in the oil and gas sector. So we'll talk a little bit about how the weight of cold, hard cash acts as a reason to go out and find some acquisitions. And finally, in this episode, we're going to be using Intel and BlackBerry. BlackBerry is still knocking about. Still exists. <laughs> to discuss the logic of spin-offs and the rationale behind selling the family silver. So perhaps we could kick it off then, um, being the fashionista that you are, Stephen, uh, with the story about Sheehan and Misguided. Yeah, I have to confess, I've I've never bought anything from Sheehan. I, I don't really know what it is, but I have been doing some research, so I, I'm better informed than I used to be. Uh, so yeah, so in these podcasts, we're going to give three rational deal rationales and then what one reason for selling so the first one we're going to talk about is economies of scale and i like this one because it is straight out of an economics textbook whenever i ask audiences students why does one company buy another company someone always says economies of scale and to an extent it is true economies of scale the textbook definition is the decreasing of unit costs as you grow as a company, which means that your gross margins, your revenue minus cost of goods sold, is increased. You are becoming more efficient. Uh, you are being able to drive down prices from your suppliers. You are benefiting from the scale that you are generating as an organization. Now, this is a, <laughs> this is a really good textbook example when looking at Sheehan and Misguided. So we put this on our deal of the week because I think it's a really, really interesting deal. So Sheehan, doing a little bit of digging, my gosh, it's a behemoth. It's valued at nearly $100 billion. It's looking looking at an IPO probably at some point next year, depending on the market. It's got 150 million users, and its revenue growth rates are over 100% year on year. So it is an amazing, fast fashion, on-demand network of manufacturers that provide clothing to users uh, pretty pretty fascinating company and they have they've been going out and buying basically failing brands and failing fashion companies forever 21 was something it was a joint venture that they they participated in last year and a couple of days ago it was announced that they had just bought 
misguided the UK, uh, again, fast fashion, but female focused fast fashion online retailer. Basically, the deal rationale behind this acquisition was, hey, look, we're Shein, we've got the most extensive customer directory. <laughs> we have 150 million people that use us. We have unbelievable data on these customers. So you've got amazing customer targeting. This is what, what we would call marketing economies of scale from a textbook definition. But also we are going to insert you, misguided, into our supplier network and our manufacturing network. Because what Shein does is they say, look, we're almost an intermediary between the, the, the buyer and the manufacturer. And we are offering you know, $50 million contracts, $100 million contracts to the manufacturing base, often in China, to go and develop these clothes at a very, very low unit cost. So Misguided just gets to insert themselves into both the marketing econ economies of scale and also what we call the supplier economies of scale, which should drive down unit costs for the Misguided label, whilst also giving them access to a far wider audience of potential customers. So it's a pretty neat, again, textbook rationale for a particular deal. Yeah, it's really well explained. Uh, if if only economics module that I studied at uni had <laughs> had it explained to me in that way, it would have made a lot more sense, it would have been a lot faster, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, and it makes a lot more sense when there's when there's a real deal on the table, you know, yeah. so often I was I was thinking about how how you would teach it without a deal on the table. And the textbook would say, look, imagine a manufacturing facility, imagine a small manufacturer, mm. um, they can't produce things as cheaply as a large manufacturer because you've got the automation in the warehouse. I would have probably given Tesla as the example, right? Their initial roadster was $150,000 because they couldn't get the cost of production down. But now you can pick up a Model Y for $50,000. Mm. That's that is kind of textbook economies of scale, but there are other types, especially when it comes to these types of acquisitions. And and I and I, and I think it makes sense uh, for Shein. Uh, again, another reason they probably picked it up on the cheap. It's another deal rationale because it was insolvent just a year ago. Right. So there's all money's you know the, as we've always said, a deal is either good or bad value depending on how much you pay. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of reasons there. Well, look b before we we move on to the the next part. Perhaps I can ask you and the listeners uh, a quick quiz question. Which brand do you think has the longest average duration of a user being on their website? Oof. So when it comes to fashion retail. <laughs> so, so a user landing on a website and you know what? The, I don't know what the average for any global website, but we're talking what seconds normally, isn't it? For before you get a bounce off. So what do you think is the the most sticky website where people come on and stay the longest? It's I guess it's interesting because you've got you've got you pro it's probably something that leverages that kind of addictive scrollability. Uh so I I immediately think of Vinted uh as something that you can scroll through for hours just looking and try and get a, a cheap, you know, a decent deal. Uh I don't think it is Vinted. I, I, you know, it could be Shein because you've because you've suggested this quiz in this in this part of the podcast. But I don't know. I, I'm going to go Shein. Why not? Well, you've obviously done your research then. You are obviously <laughs> looking at the Shein holes on TikTok. And then Absolutely. you must have landed in the right place. So, yeah, Nike is actually number two. And I think the app, I think it, I can't remember the exact second, but it's something like three and a half minutes. The average session was <laughs> Shein by far and away is the highest it's more like seven minutes which wow. is insane but um but yeah and there was h&m zara they all comprise of the other sort of top five but yeah but there you go so okay economy to scale tick yeah Got that down. nice so yeah reacting to competition yeah i think this is a really interesting one just in the context of 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 remembering <laughs> i always say this remembering that what we talk about when we talk about deals and we talk about m a and we talk about careers and finance it's all a human-based industry and we're all humans and we all look at our next door neighbors from a company perspective and we're constantly thinking mm, what are they doing you know, should we be doing that 
or should we be doing something totally different? Uh, so, so reacting to competition is such an important driver of doing deal. And we've got a couple of examples here, actually kind of it, the inverse of each other. The first one again is Sheehan. So again, Sheehan acquisition of misguided. Some people say that this, uh, this bringing in of brands, Forever 21 misguided, is a slight reaction to the growth of its Chinese competitor, Temu which is an uh, offshoot of, of the Chinese company Pingdudu. Um, and Temu, who act as a marketplace rather than a, you know, own brand uh, retailer, they act as a marketplace and they have grown much quicker than Xi'an in the US. And they have been number one in the app, the iOS app downloads every single week for the last six months in the US. So they are growing incredibly quickly. They are, you know, it becomes a bit of a lowest common denominator when it comes to these fast fashion companies. If Shein can sell a dress for ten dollars, uh, can we find a supplier that will sell one for eight dollars? And that's what it's looking like going. So Shein, instead of going, can we compete on unit costs and on sales? Well, no, maybe we can look at our competition and differentiate. So reacting to competition, I'm going to go out and buy established brands. I'm going to go out and buy Forever 21. I'm going to get them onto the Shein ecosystem. I'm going to go out and buy Misguided, get them onto the Shein ecosystem and start to become a little bit different from this upstart rival in order to <laughs> protect the valuation, which is, as we said, you know, upwards of $100 billion in order to further create that story when it comes to the IPO. So again, reacting to competition by differentiating is a really, really important one. The flip side, the flip side is, <laughs> is the fear of missing out. Mm. And we've spoken both on this podcast and on the Friday podcast a lot about this AI hype cycle or generative AI hype cycle. And I'm not sure whether you covered it on Friday. Did you cover, did you cover the Google earnings on Friday? Yeah, we were talking about Microsoft and uh, and Google, so we did talk AI. Yes, it's brilliant. So it's fantastic. So so you know, obviously Alphabet had a big earnings. Well, it's going to say it had a big earnings miss. It didn't really have an earnings miss. You know, no. let's be honest <laughs> about it. <laughs> how, how was that? How was such a successful quarter? Uh, you know, reacted with a ten cent drop in share price. Well, I, yeah. I, I mean, the like summary that. of that is when you are in the collective of the magnificent seven, anything short of magnificent. It's just not good enough as far as Wall Street is concerned these days. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, so Alphabet had a cloud computing earnings miss on the 25th of October. Microsoft had a massive uh, win, revenue 30% up, as you spoke about on Friday. Uh, and the share price of Google went down almost 10% in reaction. So what happened uh, a couple of days ago? Well, Google announced or Alphabet announced that it had... Uh, further, it, it, it had invested a further two billion dollars in AI generative AI startup Anthropic, off the back of Amazon investing four billion dollars in the same company, and obviously Microsoft with uh, OpenAI as well. So this is a jumping on the bandwagon. This is reacting to competition by doing what they're doing, right? So this is everyone in this, you know, magnificent seven, everyone trying to jump on this bandwagon because they have seen the massive, massive, massive share price increase related to this boom in generative AI. So sometimes you look at your competition and you go, I want to be different. Sometimes you look at your competition and you say, I want to buy a company so that I can be the same or I can be more like my rival that seems to be getting a little bit of a bit of a head start over me. So reacting to competition is a very, a very interesting deal rationale. Yeah. And looking at the Anthropic founding members, they were the founding members of OpenAI. So it literally doesn't get more uh, interbred in terms of the sharing <laughs> of knowledge uh, in that space. So yeah, super interesting, actually. Yeah, and who knows? And who knows what will happen? You know, just taking a step back, who know, who knows whether the the kind of valuation wheels will come off once we once we realise that the use cases may well be limited. 
However, I don't know if you've been, I mean, OpenAI's growth rate in terms of revenue is, is quite staggering <laughs> from a standing start of almost nothing. Um, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. So maybe we've got a few, a few months and years left to run on that. Cool. All right. Well, look, let's, let's discuss a little bit on using capital. Now we've discussed quite a bit on recent podcast episodes about the actual deal mechanics themselves, but maybe how it plays into the context of this conversation with Exxon and Chevron. Yeah, so using capital isn't isn't necessarily the most textbook def, uh, most textbook explanation as to why someone would go out and do a deal, but it stands to reason that if I've got a load of cash on my balance sheet, and that cash is growing and growing and growing, I am going to be under pressure from my shareholders to do something with that cash. Obviously, you can do three things with that cash. You can reinvest it in the business, or you know what we call organic growth quite slow quite steady often quite hard to find things to spend that money on within the business especially if you're an established business the second is to return it to shareholders which obviously shareholders love uh, in the form of dividends or share buybacks and the third is to go out hunting go out and, and buy another company and often when there is a lot of cash on the balance sheet shareholders will start asking the question what are you going to do with that money because remember if i'm investing in a company I don't want them to just hoard cash because I can hoard cash. You know, I want them to go out and do something with it that's going to make my investments in, you know, increase, right? So Exxon acquiring Pioneer, Chevron with its latest acquisition that we covered in Deal of the Week. This is, these are two representations of companies that have had bumper years, bumper recent years due to the spike in oil prices, uh, hoarding cash and then spending some of it. Now, especially in the case of Exxon acquiring Pioneer, Exxon has $30 billion of cash on its balance sheet. It needs to use some of it. Otherwise, it will start getting feeling the pressure. Actually, Chevron's was slightly different because it was an all share transaction. So che Chevron's recent $59 billion acquisition was an all share transaction. And that's partly because the share price from March 2020, Chevron share price, rose from $59 to $165 a share, which means that you have more, <laughs> your shares go further, you're a more valuable company. So when you're looking at an all share transaction, which means that the uh, targets shares get converted into a number of the new owners shares, means that I have more leverage because I'm a more valuable company. So using capital and leveraging valuation, leveraging increases in share price is a very common deal rationale. And obviously, when you're riding the upswing of a cyclical surge, as Exxon and Chevron has been doing, it again, it stands to reason that they should be going out and hunting and entering in this new era of oil and gas consolidation that we've spoken quite a lot about. So I always say, you know, if you want to if you want to find out who might be doing the next wave of acquisitions, just go to the balance sheet and go to the go to the increase in share price, because you know that those two factors will contribute to an urgency of finding a suitable acquisition. Yeah, and it, and it seems like at the moment, a bit of a return to reality for some of these oil majors, because we've had all of the earnings started to come out and BP this morning. So they made a, a Q3 net Q3 net income, this figure is, which makes it even more like huge. Uh, it came in at 3.29 billion for the quarter net income. Now that sounds like a, a giant figure, but actually it was short. Analysts were looking for 4 billion. And remember, a year ago, a year earlier, Q3, they were clocking in at 8.15 billion net income. So yeah, they 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 were kind of building up the war chest, so to speak, and that money is still coming in, um, evidently at this point, but has yeah. dropped off quite dramatically. And, they, and 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 look, these big oil majors, they 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 uh, they have a very very consistent dividend policy, uh, which is the main, which is the fundamental reason why a lot of a lot of a lot of people own shares in these in these companies. But eight billion in a quarter, there's going to be some room for maneuver. And, and there have been calls actually recently for BP to get active in the market. Again, is there this kind of fear of missing out? Well, your, your competitors are doing deals. 
what, what are you doing? Are you just going to sit tight? So we'll wait and see whether BP and Shell uh, start making some moves as well. Maybe a, uh, a deal between each other, perhaps. Could that even be possible? There's been, if there, there's, you often get every now and again, don't you? A little bit of murmuring around the super majors coming together. Yeah, I mean, so Exxon and Mobil was a was a pretty big uh, transaction, right? A pretty, a pretty big merger, and and I mean, Shell and BP are, are so large and so competitive with each other as the European or two of the European super majors. Anything's possible, but that would be that would be quite remarkable. Well, now's the time for Shell. BP's a bit of a uh, without a captain so to speak, an interim CEO right now. So we shall Very see. True. But um, okay, so we've covered a couple of things. Economies of scale, reacting to competition. We just discussed there using capital. Now spin-offs, something which you often hear a lot of. So how does that fit into the picture? Yeah, so I, I, like, I like to do one reason why a company would sell uh, or why an organization would consider uh, receiving offers for its company. So there are obviously two sides to every transaction and working in M&A, you will have a bank that acts on behalf of the buyer and a bank that acts on behalf of the seller. And it's got to be a deal that works for both parties. I thought I'd talk very quickly about spin-offs. Now, spin-offs are where a larger company decides to sell or spin off a division of its particular company in order potentially to unlock value that is not being realized because that particular unit is being weighed down by the rest of the company or doesn't make strategic sense. And I'm just gonna link this to a very, a little bit of theory. So as an analyst, as an M&A analyst, you are likely to do, to conduct quite a few sum of the parts valuations. So how do we value a particular company? Let's think about Alphabet. How do I value Alphabet? Well, I can do my traditional discount of cash flow, or I can do my trading and transaction comps analysis, but I can also do, I can also value the individual parts of the business to see whether the sum of the parts is more valuable than the whole. And in Google's case, well, maybe it is because you've got one of the most valuable social media companies or social media content companies in YouTube. You've got their cloud, you've got their search, it's pretty, pretty remarkable set of businesses that if they are unleashed, if they are spun off, maybe will create even more value. Just going back to our economies of scale argument, the reason why you might acquire a company, this is more of a diseconomies of scale argument. Right. Maybe you've got you've got a little bit big for your boots as a company and you've gone out and acquired a bunch of other companies and you suddenly become a bit of a mess. You have become a bit of a strategic mess with all sorts of different units doing different things. The share price gets weighed down because you tend to get valued closer to your least productive business unit relative to your most productive business business unit. So what do you do, you consider spinning off a chunk or spinning off a business unit. And that is what uh, Intel has recently announced that they are going to do with their programmable chip division and BlackBerry with its internet of things division as well. So let me give you, um, let me, let me, I was going to add a question. I was frantically typing away because something came to mind as you were describing uh, spin-offs. So just given the spirit of talking a little bit on this episode about Alphabet or Google, um, and obviously YouTube revenues. There was a US analyst that back in 2019, so this is a few years old, mind, um, that pre or forecasted how much YouTube would be valued if it was spun off into its individual entity. What do you reckon would be as a valuation standalone YouTube? Well, back in 2019. Yeah. Oh, I, it's a, it's a, Really good question. I, 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 I think it's an incredible, incredible company and probably should be valued at more than Meta is valued at the moment. I'm trying to think back to 2019. I, look, 800 billion, a trillion. <laughs> how, how are we doing? 300 billion. So, it's, so 
Uh, it's still a very big number. But in fact, that would, at the time, so context, 2019, if yeah. YouTube was valued at 300 billion, that would put it as the 15th biggest company or one of the biggest 15 in the S&P 500. So, yeah. That doesn't, it, again, it, it, it just doesn't surprise me. It's such an amazing company. And I just wonder whether it would, you know, by, by, again, I don't think that there's any discussion going on about, you know, splitting up Google, apart from if you're in the, uh, in the FTC, part of the antitrust <laughs> discussions. But yeah, an independent YouTube as an attractive investment, as, as an attract, it, it probably would be one of the top 10 in the S&P, for sure. A question from a strategy point of view, then, if I was Zuckerberg, is there any way I could use some sort of spin off or shareholding um, way of managing the virtual reality labs, which is just like leaking money, but does hold a future key source of technology that could be distribute redistributed across the business? Is there any way I can kind of off like put that away somewhere on the balance sheet to to have it away? Or is it more just the CFO doing good job engineering on conference calls? Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. It's kind of what, it's why Facebook's now called Meta and it's now, right. it's why Google's called Alphabet, right? And Alphabet is a, is a collection of different companies. The most important is their search is Google. But within that, they've got DeepMind, which is their AI research company, let's call it. Uh, and they've got, previously, they had their kind of moonshot labs where there was a huge budget for doing moonshot type businesses um, that could fail, but could also become the next trillion dollar business, a kind of incubator. Now, that's a really exciting thing to think about. And that's probably what Meta's done with its metaverse and, you know, put it in that separate section. When the economic going gets tough, this start, this division, the moonshots division or the metaverse division, that starts to become strategically a little less palatable. You're like, ah, uh, where's the money here? Like, you know, the search business is amazing for Google. The marketing and advertising business for Facebook is amazing. Just focus on that. We just want to see your EPS grow. We don't really care that much about moonshots now. During the next kind of hype cycle, maybe we could get back into it. So strategically, that's kind of what Meta's doing at the moment. Mm. But I, I might want, yeah, I'm just going to end on one point about these spin-offs. Um, we don't need to go into too much detail about Intel and BlackBerry. It's, it, it's worth it's worth just looking them up yourself. But the 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 stock market reaction, the investor reaction to both of these spin-off announcements, Intel spinning off their uh, programmable solutions group, which is what they're going to be calling it, uh, and hopefully IPOing it next year, and BlackBerry spinning off its IoT, Internet of Things division, and maybe IPOing it next year. The share prices of both Intel and BlackBerry went up. Now, Intel went up 3.5%, BlackBerry went up 5%. Think about that in the context of many of the epi episodes that we've spoken about in the last few months. Usually on the announcement of an acquisition, the acquirer share price goes down because investors would rather see that money return to them in the form of dividends or buybacks or whatever and, and, and tend to think that big acquisitions may well be dilutive as opposed to accretive to their, to, 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 to their earnings per share. Whereas in a spin-off, the typical stock market reaction is that share prices go up of the company that's spinning off because suddenly they're like, all right, well, maybe there could be a, a liquidity event, a kind of a cash event that could get returned to us. Maybe this company's going from being quite flabby to being quite focused. We quite like that. So it's quite interesting just to see the typical stock market investor reactions to these different strategic moves, whether it's an acquisition or a spin-off. Cool. Well, look, St Stephen, this is part of a four-part series. So I'm going to plug for people to make sure, if you're not already, that you subscribe to the channel because you don't want to miss those other episodes. But what can people expect from the rest of the series? 
Well, look, I've got a, I've got a very, very long list of rationale for deals. Um, and I'm going to try and patent, well, I'm going to try and match that list with things that have been going on in the news over the, over the, over the preceding week. So I can't tell you what's going to come up next week because I'm going to try and make it relatively flexible and live. But by the end of this little series, you're going to have a pretty strong compendium of strategies and rationales for why companies do deals. Cool. And just a final shout out as well. Um, I understand you've got another M&A Finance Accelerator session happening this week. Is that right? Yeah, we're going, we are going this Thursday, 4 p.m. UK time till 6 p.m. Uh, these things usually sell out, quote unquote. They get booked up. It doesn't cost any money. Uh, they get booked up really, really quickly. So follow the follow the socials, follow LinkedIn for, for the next for the next session. But the next one is coming up this coming Thursday at 4 p.m. Cool. The link you'll be able to find in the show notes. So just go there. There's probably a few spaces left because we'll drop this episode uh, and then there'll be a day or so until the event. But yeah, hopefully you can get in on that action. But yeah, thanks, Stephen. Thanks everyone for listening and see you for the next episode. Thank you, Anne.